Hi everyone. Today I'm here to talk about some of the things I read in February. February was an unconventional reading month for me for a couple of reasons. First, I only finished one audiobook, which is far fewer than I normally read. I typically get through at least three or four. I don't really know what happened in terms of my audiobook reading dropping off. I didn't really feel like my habits changed at all. I did start three nonfiction audiobooks that I gave up on, and that was time I spent listening that didn't turn into a red book. So that definitely affected my numbers. So I only finished seven things total in February, and three of them were books I read for the BookTube prize. So I can't actually talk about them at all in this video because I'm not really allowed to talk about my feelings in any of those books until the round is completed at the end of March. So end of March, beginning of April, I will be posting a video of my full thoughts and feelings and all those like a really juicy wrap up for the BookTube prize, but I can't talk about those books for now. That leaves four books, two of which I filmed reviews for. One is already up, and the other one I'm going to be posting later in the month, just because the book doesn't come out for a couple weeks. Uh, but I will talk about them briefly here. So the first is The Unspoken Name, which was a really highly anticipated fantasy novel from Tor about an orc priestess. On the day she's supposed to die as a ritual sacrifice for her patron god, she decides to kind of throw away everything that she's ever known to help out this guy, uh, kind of take back a city that he used to to control and has the control has been taken away from him. That's sort of the inciting incident. It actually is much more about her trying to help this guy later find this magical artifact called the Reliquary. I'd say that takes up maybe two thirds of the novel. I didn't enjoy this mostly because I thought that the uh, the fact that she was an orc didn't really matter or affect the story. It was just, I think, a gimmick to make it seem a little more unique and interesting than it actually was because Otherwise, it wasn't that unique. I liked the use of the Pantheon of Gods, but I ultimately think that this book was misadvertised. And I think the author often favored plot momentum over character development, and we skipped a lot of really juicy, interesting moments and possible interactions in favor of moving the story forward. Uh, I talk about this in much more detail, though, in my video, so if you're interested, I will link that. Another book that I have reviewed, I just haven't posted the video yet, is for The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. This comes out at the end of the month. It's really highly anticipated, so I have filmed a full review, and I don't want to give my feelings away too much, so I will just tease that I don't think this is as successful as Station Eleven, and I think it will probably disappoint some people. And it didn't really work for me for a lot of reasons. But but I think ultimately it just boils down to I don't think the plot is as compelling and I don't feel like all the narrative elements that she's trying to weave together end up kind of coming together in the same magical way it did in Station Eleven. Um, it just doesn't, didn't feel as effortless and didn't suck me in in the same way. But I still think it's a fine book. I didn't hate it. I didn't think it was terrible, but it was a little disappointing kind of hoping that I would love it as much as I loved Station Eleven, and I just, I didn't. But I have a full review coming in a couple of weeks, so look out for that if you want more of my full thoughts, or of course you can just wait till when this book comes out at the end of the month, and make your own opinion for yourself, because I feel like generally the reviews have been positive, more positive than I felt about it, so I can just have the minority opinion in this case, and that's fine. So with those five out of the way, I only have two books to really talk about in this video, which is it's kind of weird and short, but I will try and keep it that way just because I don't have too terrible much to say about either of these books. So the first of the two books I'm going to talk about is Fence, Volume 1 by C.S. Picot and Joanna the Mad. This is a pretty popular sports graphic novel series about fencing. I only really picked this up because I got a free copy of it at the ALA Midwinter Conference, and I hadn't really thought this would be for me because I've never really like watched sports anime and I've never played sports. This shirt is very misleading. I don't actually know what position I would play if I were on the Ravenclaw Quidditch team, which this claims I'm the captain. I think I'd probably be a seeker just because it requires the least coordination. Uh, that's a totally unrelated aside. So yes, I, I got this because at the Boombox booth they were giving away free completed trades and it was hard to say no to something that would otherwise be like a $9.99 graphic novel, and they go down so fast and so easy that usually it doesn't feel like I've got my money's worth after spending $10 from something that takes me less than an hour to read. But anyway, that's why I got it. Um, but I was surprisingly delighted by it. I really love the art. I think the fight scenes are actually quite dynamic and fun to read. Uh, that's when I'm reading like a narrative fight, I will kind of get lost, but I think that this is really just like generally well illustrated and drawn. It does a nice combination of like a more typical art style mixed with like 
little like chibi cute uh, drawings as well that I think gives the the story a lot of personality and vibrancy to it. I just think it's overall really well done. I wish that the story had gotten maybe a little bit further in these issues because I don't think that much actually happened in this. We were kind of establishing a lot of relationships and building up to something later, but it definitely was effective in terms of me wanting me to get the next volumes. I think that there are four out right now. It has queer characters on the page. It's fun. It's pretty low stakes. I had a blast with it, so I am definitely going to be looking forward to reading the next volumes, and I'm really glad that I got this because, like I said, I don't think I would have if I hadn't gotten one for free, so it's cool. And that leaves the last book that I'm going to briefly discuss, which is a memoir that I listened to, the only audiobook I actually read this month, which was Uncanny Valley by Anna Wiener. This falls into the genre of books that help me feel seen in that it's about people feeling disenfranchised with the tech industry, which is kind of what happened to Anna Wiener. So she was working in publishing and felt kind of disenfranchised with publishing. She thought she would try her hand working at a software startup. So she worked at the company Oyster for a while. Before it was actually a public product, she was working on their team and kind of helping out in their office. That doesn't really work out. So she ends up working for GitHub, which is a really popular, um, very in like the tech world, the coding world, it's a very well known platform for uploading and sharing your code. It's kind of like a version control system where you can keep track of changes that have been made to your code. You can share code really easily. You can download other people's code really easily and contribute to it pretty seamlessly. It's a tool that basically everyone in the software industry uses. So it was like kind of cool to hear about the inside of this company of a product that I've actually used. I had also used Oyster. So that was kind of fun insider baseball as well. But she talks about what it was like to work at both of those companies. She does great a great job of contrasting just like how different publishing and startup culture are and how startup culture is really a bubble and when you're in it, everyone just sort of acts like that's how every company should work or does work. So many of these startup bros don't have any experience in any other kind of company. So they are lacking a context of like how most of the world actually works and how most businesses work when they're kind of doing their own thing. So I liked the parallels between publishing and tech. She also talks quite a lot about the tech world's need to optimize everything and how everything is data driven and talking about the kind of manipulative ways that these companies use people's data. And she talks about the way that everything in the tech world is about optimization to the point where we are sacrificing our individuality and our independence. And she simply mentions listening like HelloFresh and how um, you're sacrificing creativity and individuality for convenience. Things like that have seamlessly worked into a lot of people's lives and trying to optimize them. Um, and if the sacrifices are worth it. And I actually am a user of HelloFresh, so I thought that that was kind of an inter interesting point that she made, even though it has made my life so much easier that like, I'm okay with that. She discusses, of course, the dangers of big data and surveillance, just how like bonkers the software industry is uh, and how insular it is and kind of how culty sometimes it can feel to be a programmer and have this like shared vocabulary that is very industry, like jargon heavy and um, how people can get so passionate and so, enmeshed in it and and really lose themselves to it like completely disrupting work-life balance sacrificing like everything about yourself for your job and kind of being expected to see the company as your family these are narratives that are are used a lot like if you don't work all the time even when you're not at work like do you actually care about this company and this family that you're in and i have this note that says wow this didn't make me miss tech at all being able to work from home and share memes on the company slack is not worth the everything else part. You kind of learn to accept and tolerate racism and sexism in the workplace. And there are seemingly no checks in place. Like for instance, the company that I worked at, there was no HR. There was just a guy named Stuart that you had to go talk to. And he was also like the finance guy. And it's like, if I have, you know, an issue with sexism, I'm not probably going to confide in Stuart. So I'll just grin and bear it. Um, and so yeah, wow, it just like made me super not miss tech and then feel very, very strongly positive about my move away from it. I worked in the software industry for about a year and a half before I decided it was emphatically not for me for a lot of reasons. And it reminded me a lot of those reasons. It made me feel like all the more validated in my choice to leave. And so, yeah, it was a uh, illuminating in some ways, particularly the ins and outs of GitHub, which I think are seen, it's seen usually as a, as a really good company, but it has a lot of issues with it. Endemic sexism, even at the companies that you think might be good. I thought it was a fascinating memoir. Maybe it meant more to me because of my personal relationship to the industry and our experiences being similar. But I think that there also is a lot um, that other people might get out of this book just because 
a lot of us, you know, we're, we're nerds who know a lot about the publishing industry. And so seeing it contrasted with the software industry, I think it might be an interesting and eye-opening parallel for some people. And it's not one of like the more heavy and upsetting memoirs that I typically read, but it was still really juicy and good. And I thought she had some good insights about tech startup culture and sort of the way that culture is moving when tech becomes more integrated and just ideas and thoughts like that. So overall, I enjoyed it quite a lot. It was the highlight of my reading month. Hopefully March is much better. I have a lot of videos planned for March about the booktube prize and checking out my goals thus far since at the end of March we will be already a quarter through the year somehow. I know that it was kind of a weird all over the place wrap up but if you've read any of the books that I mentioned I would love to hear your thoughts. If you're curious to hear more of my thoughts on the unspoken name I will link that video and look for the Glass Hotel review coming soon. Oh and another thing is because I've been so off of my, my audiobook game I would love some recommendations for great audiobooks. If you have anything that you think will be fast-paced, snappy, unputdownable, if you will, um, I really need an good, some good audiobooks to churn through to kind of get my momentum back up. So if you have anything in mind, I was thinking of listening to The One, and I was also thinking of starting the Reluctant Royals series. So if you have any other recommendations, I would love them. Please put them in the comments. And I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.